Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 59, Warfare in Wales. To this point, we have talked a lot about the people, the religion, the culture, and the kings, but one subject we have yet to really draw into and address is warfare, and specifically how warfare is carried out, uh, what types of formations come about because of the experience of Wales, as well as how various forms of military have developed over time. Part of the reason for this, of course, is that we don't have a lot of information. The sources are very weak on this information. So it's not like we can go and say, oh, yeah, this definitely shows us there's the formations. There's knight so-and-so that was leading this force into this battle, and then knight so-and-so led that. That doesn't really happen. It doesn't really happen anywhere in our source material on either side, to be fair, because the Saxons don't have an easy one either. But we are going to talk a little bit today about how the Welsh military forces developed, likely, and kind of, and more in detail about them. So for the Welsh wars, it was not more common or specifically different or specially compared to other locations. There was no Welsh way that was somehow special. Often in the past 200 years, there has been an attempt to make the past fit the narrative story including that somehow being isolated made you simple or different. Often this narrative is determined how we look at the Welsh kingdoms and how they fought wars, carried out peace, and how they treated prisoners and treated others. As if this was some sort of exception to the rule. Much was made at the end of the Welsh independence about how the Welsh were savage but cowardly fighters. Gerald of Wales, as a Norman, called the Welsh quick to attack, but equally quick to retreat. He was making a grand story about how in order to fight the Welsh, you've got to fight like the Welsh, not like this, the Norman way of fighting, in part to keep the king off their backs. And so he made that point. And one of, this is one of the ways that he made it, was that their patriotism carried them forward in ways that you just couldn't deal with them normally. Uh, his eloquent writing and successful... Uh, ability to publish made him popular for generations, and those after him, the writers of the Middle Ages, seemed to take up this idea and run with it. The concept that moved into later historical research was the belief that the Welsh patriotism meant that they were much more willing to jump into the fray, but their inexperience meant they were unable to take on proper professional armies. This would somehow lead to an idea that the Welsh fought less honorably by using guerrilla warfare instead. This would allow the Welsh to bleed their enemy without having to face them in open warfare, where the idea was that they could be easily defeated until they took on the Norman ideas of warfare. In other words, that the Welsh were weak-willed or unable to actually fight a proper battle, so to speak. Overwhelmingly, though, this belief was, as Dr. Sean Davis argues, wrong, backward, and it gives the wrong impression of the Welsh, both as exceptional and noble savages. The idea that they were simpler or purer fighters goes back to the time of Caesar and Tacitus. The Ordovis, the tribe that Gwyneth appears to descend from, were often praised by Tacitus for their ruthlessness and dogged determination in warfare, and were given descriptions as if they were more pure because they didn't take on the Roman way of life. This idea of a noble savage is a long one which has been used by both sides, typically in a very biased way, to explain life for people without writing. This idea that somehow their very concepts were, are more pure, but their mentality is as simple as their lifestyle, is ancient in thought. It goes back to the original Greek barbarianism idea. And it continues to this day. There's still people that appeal to this idea that somehow people who weren't literate, who lived along in a, shall we call it, Stone Age way, were somehow more pure than current day populations. Somehow not lost in the search for more wealth, the search for more material, because they didn't have it, so they didn't need it. Uh, often these concepts create a mistaken identity, and it often gives people the appeal to this idea to defend their group and to argue that they were better than the invader because they led a more pure lifestyle. 
and that they were later corrupted by the invaders. That's actually one of the big points of Tacitus is that he's arguing that the Roman imperial reward actually offers something of a negative and that it actually creates fat, happy people that go to their grave basically being destroyed by this. And and his appeal to the idea that somehow people like the Ordovice call back to a past of a golden age and a golden ideal. So this kind of kicks around and, and both sides kind of use this. I mean, if you think of British colonialism and the way the ideas of bringing you know, civilization to the savage and, and the very racial way, terminology they use about this kind of thing. It, it's very similar here. I mean, it, it's giving humanity no benefit of the same intelligence that you have. Humans are smart. Good generals plan for terrain that they are in. And it's highly unlikely that the Welsh were a bunch of peasant farmers who gathered at the call to lead their armies. In fact, there is plenty of evidence that the Welsh in the Saxon period and later medieval periods continued to have professional forces which were trained in fighting and carried out all sorts of open and guerrilla warfare, as were called for by the circumstances. Obviously, if you're fighting somebody in the mountains, you're not going to use tactics of open warfare. It just doesn't make sense. And in a country which is generally mountainous, it makes sense that you would use different tactics. And in an open plain, an open field, you'd obviously go in a much more open concept attack. You'd obviously have to deal with this frontal assault. It's arrogant to assume otherwise. If anything, history teaches us is to remember that sources are biased and we must view them in that lens of skepticism until proven otherwise. And as we've discussed before in this podcast, that concept is so out of date and gives little credit to humans who represent the side without literacy. And it's only because the other side's literate and writing about it that we get this viewpoint and get this idea that somehow these people didn't have something and and needed to be civilized in order to live like the rest of us. Or, you know, in other sides of that, to be fair, people who are, you know, the descendants of those people or believers in those people will argue the opposite end, that somehow they were more pure and more special and more exceptional because of those things. And it's very difficult to extricate yourself from those arguments. But when you're talking history, you need to. You need to get away from using the same old, same old. You need to talk about things better. You need to be more accountable to the history you're reading and the history you're discussing. And the best way to do that is realize that just because somebody is in a small kingdom doesn't mean they weren't up on what was going on in the world. We still have the same methods of communication in this era as we have in every other medieval country in that world. And they knew what was going on. They knew some of the changes that were happening. The reason why they kept certain ideas and not others is because they work better. You know, at the end of the day, if you can do certain things and that works for you, then you're going to appeal to that. You're going to do that more oftenly. So let's talk more in depth about this. In the poem of the Gadothan, there are light cavalry, combined most likely with infantry units. The cavalry, made up as they typically were in the medieval period with nobles, were the ones that got mentioned, of course. They're always, you know, bigger figures in society get all the mentions, the smaller people don't. It's just the way it goes for many, many, many hundreds of years. They, along with the lighter infantry, would be fast-moving, be able to handle rough terrain, Which, again, that would make sense in Wales. You don't want a force that's heavily armored, heavily shielded, trying to march their way through. This is why the Romans ran into trouble in Scotland. They couldn't handle change quickly. And so, in the first and second centuries, they struggled mightily with trying to take Scotland because of that change in environment and change in tactics. And they had the similar problems with the Germans, actually. Once they got into the Teutonberg Forest and things of that nature, you couldn't maneuver in there like you would normally. So you had to change your methodology, your tactics, your structure in some cases, and what you wore. And so, of course, they would change their armor. They would change to being lighter cavalry instead of decked out, armored, you know, everything armored over the way we think of medieval cavalry these days as knights in heavy armor. Well, that didn't exist in this period. In this period, most people had chainmail. 
uh, plate was not used as much. Uh, they might or might not have a helmet. They would have pikes more often than swords because pikes were cheaper and easier to come by, especially for the peasantry. So your infantry typically would have pikes. Your noble is going to be the one who has a sword because he's inheriting it or, you know, had the money to pay for a new one. So those are the guys that are going to have the big, sharp, pointy, bright, expensive weapons. The other guys are going to have the rudimentary things that, funny enough, do just as good a job. So keep that in mind as we go along. Obviously, things change over time. And much like everything else, as developments occur in society that change it, you know, the invention of the longbow, the invention of uh, cannons and guns and things will change the style and make it up of warfare. But at this point, you know, chainmail can pretty much do a lot of what you want it to do. You don't need a lot of really heavy coated armor and your horse doesn't typically need it either. So largely they avoided that and it allows them to move and allows them to move great distances very quickly. Um, this idea likely has shaped from the Roman period as cavalry were key components in Roman strategy, especially in the later period. They would end up carrying out raids, they would act as lightning attackers, that would basically to go in and cause confusion with the infantry. To some success and some failure, there's lots of cases where it said that the cavalry wasn't as effective as they were made out to be, but nonetheless, and they would be used for that. The other thing that they would do, actually, is help patrol the frontiers, because, of course, if you're on a horse, you can travel much faster, you can cover more territory, you can make sure things are, you know, if something does happen, you have a quick way out and a quick way back to other soldiers who could actually then move in to help you. So it makes a lot of sense. And again, if you think that there's a carryover, and it would, again, make sense, there would be a carryover in the way things were done in the 4th and 5th centuries into the 6th and the 7th, then obviously some of these Roman ideas would have then carried on in the Welsh mindset, and they would definitely have carried forward. They do carry forward to a degree with the Saxons as well. So we do have this commonality in this regard. Um, much of the succeeding Welsh force continues the tradition of using cavalry to patrol, to act as the groups best suited to create confusion. As horses were, of course, expensive to keep and to feed, they almost always fell to the noble classes to carry out that role. The knight of the later Middle Ages was a professional thug hired to fight for the king and the country, as far and wide and often would be mercenaries that were hired to go to other kingdoms to cause and help various causes there. But in the beginning, the class grew from out of the noble classes of lords. They weren't just anybody, simply because, much like a sword, a horse is an expensive thing. You can't typically have a war horse if you are on the farm growing wheat. War horses don't do that. They're meant to be able to handle confrontation and fighting and be able to handle the sound differences. You know, a farm horse is going to be a little bit more skittish in an area where there's screaming and shouting and fighting going on. So the Middle Ages will breed war horses that become able to constantly Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because 
The news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. Endure this contact and this noise and be able to fight through it and carry out what they're told to do. And so we know that that's a big key. So if that's the case, then you start to see them move away from that. We also know, studying the establishment of the household under the Saxons, that there was a component of loyalty in the household. This was this created a system called the Ferd. This was not simply a liege lord system. It was also a military one. You owed not only loyalty to your house, you owed your military strength to that house. This system meant that you were needed to be aggressively putting your point forward, then these people needed to act in the best interests of the house, regardless of what side they were on. So if the leader of your house decides to go against the king, you darn well better join him in that fight. This created a sense of professionalism as the Ferd needed to be ready to go at a moment's notice. They were small but organized bands of war fighters. They were not peasant farmers. With the way the Welsh kingship rules worked, it would be very similar in nature with the loyalty being owed to the head of the house. As we talked about before, kinship, you had a head of the house, and they were in charge. So they would develop this same sort of idea. This expression of this idea of family comes in the term teleu, uh, which translates as family. If we look at the way Welsh writers depict military forces projecting power in the forms of Gildas and Ninius, we see that some of this carries over from old Roman tradition, including having a leader of battle, or a dux erat bellorium, these leaders are ensconced with their households, and they are consistent in raiding and warring with local rivals, and Gildas goes so far as to describe them as demanding rooms and boards from religious houses. He said they plundered and terrorized everyone, including holy men. He also said they rewarded their followers and treated them with great honor. Much to, obviously, Gildas's point, the detriment of everyone else. This would be consistent with late antiquity and the medieval period in general, where your household was expected to be rewarded for their loyalty and given the best spoils of war. These leaders of the Telu would become eventually the strong men who became kings of their households. They became part of this king's retinue, or the Gosgoroth. Now, how big was a Telu? We don't exactly know, and it's difficult for us to be able to do the math on this simply because there's not anybody who's gone out and written books about it. You have to remember in the Roman period, there was actually people who were writing about the military, giving us specific information about how formations were made, how tactics were constructed. They gave us all sorts of different ways of understanding how the army moved and was fed and and all of these different things in part because they had a wide and varied administration. That doesn't exist at this point. So you don't have this kind of commentary. You don't have easily understood methodologies for realizing what was going on. So what we do understand is that typically in Welsh law, a king could have up to 36 people in his retinue. This is for when he traveled to various locations. They would make up his associates and guests not typically his guard, which could be much bigger for obvious reasons. The number of men in a telu is not honestly known, but rationally, they were not overly large. A number that many academics settled on was approximately 300. But that number is one that has mystic qualities, apparently. So the fact that Godothan mentions it might be more poetic license than reality. Uh, the concept and the way we understand other setups of like the Ferd, for example, the Ferd typically didn't get bigger than between 80 and 250 people. So largely your household wasn't that big. And typically when you looked at the sources like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and other places, they talked about the king's retinue being 50 or the king's guardman or the king's telu being around 50. And this would make some sense, because if the Telu represents the leaders of the military, then having 50 to attend the king to be his head of the military would make way more sense. If you think about it from a standpoint of most militaries, 
you know, the, the, the privates make up the large percentage of the military, the corporal's the next, sergeant's the next, and then you get into the officer corps, which is generally much smaller until you get to the highest levels where there is five or one, depending on how high up you want to go. So it's an ever-increasing pyramid going from the bottom to the top. It reduces, obviously. So it'd be similar here. You wouldn't have 300 men to run 1,000. That wouldn't make any sense. But you could have 50, and that would make sense. And we have to remember that these militaries are not massive militaries. They're not fifty to 60,000 soldiers wandering into the field to fight battles yet. That's coming, but not yet. Mostly because there just isn't that big of a population. And it's part of the problem in Wales is you don't have as big of a population in Wales as you do in England, in Scotland even now. But certainly in those days, I would argue that it, there still wasn't a major population. There's nothing like London or Bristol or any of these, or York, as it'll eventually be called, in Wales at this point. Most of the communities are small. Most of the areas are low population areas. And of course, because of the mountain ranges, you have even less people in those areas than you do in, have in the settled south and north. And so you don't have that same degree of population, so you haven't got a massive number of troops you can call on. But even with only 50, you can still accomplish a great deal. And as we'll talk about further on this subject, we'll certainly talk about how this affects war fighting. Because as we go into the later Middle Ages, into the 1300s specifically, towards the end of Welsh independence, now you have a very formalized, very medieval-looking army facing another very formalized, very medieval-looking army. And there is no real difference. Now, the argument was made in the past that this became because the Normans arrived and the Normans changed how the Welsh fought. There may be some truth to that because the Welsh were fighting Saxons who had a different style and a different method. But likely... It was just the gradual change of medieval fighting rather than specifically a Norman way of fighting that changed things. As the Vikings came, as influence of modernization in dealing with castles and dealing with different uh, cities and how they would protect themselves and dealing with the basic day-to-day -day activities, suddenly you know, armor becomes much more popular. There's much greater usage of it. Swords become much more frequent. There isn't, you know, as much separation there. Uh, peasants are still using pikes. Let's not kid ourselves. But the usage of weapons of war gets much more complex, just as it always does. It gets much more detailed. It gets much better at dealing with the current so that the next group has to invent something new, which then creates another idea. The Welsh themselves will do that with the way they develop the longbow. But it doesn't mean that they're exceptional. They're not different, really, from other medieval European countries. This idea, this concept is wrong-headed, backward, and we need to come and get over that. And that's kind of why we do something like this podcast, to kind of give you an idea of what it is like for these people and how they're fighting their wars. And as I say, we'll get much more in-depth in this in the coming weeks as we talk more about... Welsh history, we're getting into Alfred, which will develop that even more because the Vikings are now kicking around and the wars with them will have a big weight on what the Welsh do. Until next time, everyone, thank you so much. We'll see you again in two weeks. As always, I can be reached at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can reach out to me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. Uh, you can come to our Facebook site and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And if you would like to support our podcast, you can do so via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. Thank you, everybody. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Take care. Bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast, your one stop shop for unique jewelry paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.
This is Peter. And this is Tom. We want to tell you guys a little bit about our podcast. Tom and I met in college, became best friends, and then teachers almost 20 years ago. Sometimes school just does not allow us to elaborate on the topics that we find interesting, like the real shark attacks that inspired the movie Jaws, or the real historical context to Indiana Jones artifacts. Where does cereal come from? Or are zombies real? Does Ben Franklin really deserve to be on a $100 bill? On our podcast, just like in our class, there are no stupid questions. Just two friends having a lighthearted conversation about history, pop culture, and the context of current events. Listen to History Teachers Talking Podcast from Evergreen Network, anywhere you get your podcasts.